the summer of 1979, I just finished my senior year of college, and I was at a low point. And you know, when you're at a low point, you're capable of getting in all these certain types of situations that you normally wouldn't get into. Um, it was a really hot and miserable summer. I lived in this horrible sublet, you know, with torn drapes and uh, the doorbell didn't work. Um, and, you know, pretty much everybody I knew had already left. This is in Philadelphia. And uh, so I was kind of lonely, didn't know anybody. And worst of all, I hadn't quite graduated. I still needed some more credit. So I was doing this bullshit independent study and it was <laughs> going really badly. And I would go to the library and, you know, read the sports section and then think, well, maybe I'll just nap for five minutes. And then two hours later, you've got this red mark on your forehead, you know, from your, your head on the, on the carol. So it just wasn't going well. The other thing I was doing was reading books outside on the be on this bench next to the statue of Ben Franklin. And I, I would get these, like, what I thought were these really impressive and cool books. So I'd be sitting there, and I'd purposely not cover the cover of the book with my hand and sort of point it up so people would walk by and think, wow, look at that really cool guy reading that cool book. And, you know, the ultimate would be that this was my, my strategy for meeting women, that, you know, one day I'd be reading some cool book and I'd hear this voice saying, oh, what are you reading? And I mean, this beautiful woman, and, you know, one thing would lead to another, and stories. And then, that, that, this isn't about that, but well, it kind of is. <laughs> so one day I was, I was sitting on this bench, and I was reading this book called Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon, which is this... The New York Times described it as bone-crushingly dense. It's sort of this <laughs> iconic postmodern book that is, the idea of reading it is much better than actually reading it. <laughs> so I'm reading this book, and then all of a sudden I hear this voice say, what are you reading? And I look up, and it's this Japanese woman about my age, and she's looking at me with this expression of you know, keen interest on her face. And I say, oh, and I tell her what I'm reading, and she says, well, what's it about? And I, I didn't really know what it was about, so I just sort of parroted what was on the back of the cover, and you know, she didn't know what I was talking about. And then she says, have you ever felt lost, like you have no direction in your life? And I said, uh, yes, I guess, I don't know, sure. <laughs> and then she tells me that her name is Mashiko, and when she was growing up in Japan, she felt lost and had no direction in her life, and it got so bad she even thought about killing herself at, at times. But then she met these people that, that saved her, this, this group of people, and <laughs> changed everything for her. So at this point, you know, just want to say, I was an idiot, but I wasn't stupid. <laughs> I knew that she was a member of this cult that had been going around campus, and I don't want to say which cult it was because they're still around, and you know. <laughs> so um, we talked a little bit more, and she, she told me that you know I asked her. She said you know she walks around till nine or ten o'clock at night, and I said oh that's really dangerous around here. It's West Philadelphia, and she's like God will take care of me, and you know I said I hope so. You know what do you what do you say to that? <laughs> so. Uh, she, before she leaves, she asked me two questions. One, she asked me if I'd like to go to dinner at their house, she and her friends, and I say no. And then she asked me for my phone number and address. And I give, them, I give her my phone number and address, and she leaves, and I, and I realize I have this moment of stark realization that, you know, <laughs> I have hit rock bottom. I mean, <laughs> these people have built-in loser detectors. They, they go around. <laughs> They can, they can smell the, the whiff of failure, the smell of desperation, and I was the low-hanging fruit. So, over the next couple weeks, she just pursued me relentlessly. It was this, this campaign to get me to go to dinner with, at, at their house. And so, I'd be walking somewhere, and I'd hear this clop, clop, clop behind me, and she'd be running after me, and she'd ask me to go, and I'd say no. She called me on the phone. I stopped answering the phone after a while. Um, she actually wrote me a letter. Um, she probably visited me, but since my doorbell was broken, I never, I was like a negative being a positive. So finally, um, I had one friend who was still, still in Philadelphia, and he had, was also being pursued by someone else from the same group. So we decided, let's just go get these people off our backs, and you know, but we're, we're bored, it'll be an experience, all this stuff, you know, you're, you're a college kid. So the day we're going to go over, I go to the library and I do all this research into this group and read about all these scandals they're involved in and all this really offensive stuff. And 
you know, this is all what, when I should have been working on my independent study project, of course. <laughs> and um, so that night we, we go, we walk to their house for dinner, it's like 10 blocks away. And we're, I'm getting more and more nervous. And you have to understand, in those days, cults were a lot scarier than they are today. Um, this is only a few years after Jonestown. Um, before that, you had the Symbionese Liberation Army. And three years after this, you had the whole situation with MOVE in Philadelphia, where the police dropped a firebomb on a house, burned down a whole city block. So cults are really scary, and I'm, I'm, all, I'm all worried, I'm all paranoid. I'm like, you know, what if they put drugs in the food and I wake up on some farm, you know, in the central <laughs> Pennsylvania, and I never see my family again, and stuff like that. So we get there, and the house is well lit up. It looks very inviting. We walk in, and you know, everybody's really super nice. You know, they want to know about you, and there's all these people our age, and um, you know, we, we sit down in a circle, and first they, they sing some songs, and they're not these weird cult songs. There are things like Michael Road the Boat Ashore, stuff like that. <laughs> and then they, they play this game where they go around the circle, and everybody has to say their name and their favorite drink, only it can't be alcoholic. And so, <laughs> My friend says he likes cold water or something, and they're like, oh, that's great, that's great. Um, <laughs> I say I like tea, and they're going, oh, what kind, ginseng, oolong, you know? And I say, um, Lipton, I don't know. And, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> so there was one guy there who was sort of the, the head of the house, and he was older than everybody else. He was uh, maybe in his 40s. He was, they called him the minister. They referred to him that way. And, he was kind of creepy. He was sort of had these beady little eyes behind these thick glasses, and um, he basically says, "Okay, we're we're about to eat dinner, and you can smell this really delicious food coming from the kitchen." He said, "But first of all, we're going to go upstairs. Before we have our physical nourishment, we're going to get our spiritual nourishment." So they they make us all go upstairs to this room, and the room is festooned with balloons and streamers. And I say, "Oh, is it someone's birthday?" And they say, "No, someone's rebirth day." <laughs> So we sit in these rows, and Mashiko is, is next to me, and she's delighted that I'm there. Of course, she's beaming, and my friend's uh, handler, you know, also is there next to him, and s several people are filling out the rows. And this minister guy gives this, like, long lecture. It's like a half hour. It seems even longer. Just, you know, and not to be disrespectful. Well, I'll be disrespectful. It was, it was kind of moronic, you know. <laughs> And basically about how their ultimate leader was some guy who lived overseas as like the Messiah, and there's all these diagrams that prove that, and he draws these, draw, draws these two timelines on the bulletin board that, you know, from, from the beginning of time to Jesus, and then from Jesus to this guy overseas, their leader, and because there's a straight line connecting the two, that proves it, you know, things like that. <laughs> and so, we start asking him questions, and this friend of mine was really good at sort of pointing out logical inconsistencies and fallacies. So he starts peppering this guy, and I start asking questions about the, the things that I had read in the, in the research I'd done on the scandals and things like that. And so um, the dinner bell goes off, and he says, um, okay, we can go down to dinner, but, but some people need a little bit more spiritual nourishment, so <laughs> you guys have to stay for, for just a little bit more. So we keep asking him questions, and he's getting more and more flustered and agitated, and um, finally he, he turns to us and he says, you know, you can lead some people to the well of knowledge, but you can't make them drink it. You guys have to leave right now. <laughs> So we get up, and I look over to Mashiko, and she's kind of pet mortified <laughs> about how this is going. Um, and um, as we're leaving, this other, some, one of their other people who lived in the house, he turns to us and he says, you guys must be ministers of Satan. <laughs> but we like that, because it makes us strong. <laughs> we say, OK, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so we leave, and. Um, you know, I felt a little bit of a ba bad about Mashiko, but not really, because what would have not disappointed her joining this cult, you know? And so, basically, the upshot was that I, um, I um, stopped sitting on a bench next to Ben Franklin's uh, <laughs> statue, and um, I never finished Gravity's Rainbow. <laughs> Thank you.